Hey everybody, it's 5.35 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, supposedly July 31, 2018. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Well, I want to start out by informing everybody uh, what the reason for the extended window between Fomenko readings is. It is because I currently have two, in my opinion, really intelligent men who have been exchanging their work and having a, a very, very productive dialogue between one another, which I'm privileged to be the go-between, um, so that I can uh, read their exchanges and look at the work that they've produced <clears throat> so that's been that's been really great but I'll tell you something that's challenging if you're not if you're not at that level mathematically and statistically speaking and these gentlemen know how to use programs that I don't know how to use. They spreadsheet their work. Uh, when I spreadsheet, based on absolute necessity, um, I do it pretty much manually. Um, and I'm sure it would make it much faster if I would just uh, go back over my college courses of spreadsheeting and get myself back in line like that. But I can't say it enough times, I can't stress it enough how much time that not only the Obri studies, but also, uh, <clears throat> for instance, the current paper on um, really population growth from Abram all the way up until... Uh, all of the tribes and all of their descendants, actually. So none of the uh, patriarchs would be alive at that time. But all of the descendants of all of the tribes be dwelling in this Aretz Gashan, the land of Goshen, in Mutsrim. And they're getting ready to leave. And we would have to know uh, that figure. And we can work really well from that figure. In order to do this, though... Um, I had to extrapolate, and to extrapolate those kind of numbers, I had to do a lot of figuring on what the size of Abram's company would be uh, in Genesis 12 and 13, and actually 14. That's where, that's kind of within the first year, Abram's in the land of Canaan. You get a good idea of the size of his company by a description in 14. Then you can figure that by world averages of population sizes. You can take the demographics of many given places. And when you start looking at that, you, you see that there are these, um, these pretty good constants in peacetime. Uh, the only thing that has really screwed with the population of the world in the last uh, few centuries, at least, are all of the unnecessary wars, of course. And obviously, this culling that these uh, people at the top, so they think, uh, the culling that they're doing has nothing to do with the limitation of land or resources. It has everything to do with their fear of the people getting way out of their control. They are already working night and day to control us today. Consider the internet and social media and all of the perceived and real advantages that those things have had to us. And then consider that they don't offer up anything like that for nothing. And you have to consider that they have been using these very things to, uh, to gather algorithmic data uh, 
because, in my opinion, this is the way I perceive it, they have been using it from the start to figure our patterns, the way we think, how we are acting, what percentage of which populations are going in what direction. They've used all of that to try to stay a few steps ahead of us. That's the whole point of it, in my opinion. Um, <clears throat> so I, I am going to continue today with looking at New Testament quotes and Old Testament contexts. I'm going to say this probably every time I make one of these videos because I can't be clear enough that it is not that I am questioning the office of Redeemer and Mashiach or Messiah of um, Yusho of Nazareth. I'm not doing that. I'm pointing out things that every person who purports to believe the Bible should be aware of these things. And as I go, I'm, I'm going to be pointing out other things that I would just hope most people would find that these items have been a point of nag to their mind, at, just at some point or another. And you know, I've found, because of the way that I was raised, in the sort of household I was raised in, I was raised in a Pentecostal household, and in Pentecostal households, they're very much like Baptist households, except the Pentecostals be believe in speaking in tongues and slain in the Spirit and other things, and the, you know, the Baptists typically don't. But both of them are typically uh, big KJV ad advocates, um, on top of, you would never find them questioning these things. Uh, they are, for one thing, far too fearful to question these things. Now, there's a huge difference between fearing Yahweh, our God, and having a very healthy fear and respect of our Messiah, who has been placed above all things in heaven and on earth, having dominion. We must fear them, I believe. That is a healthy way to think and to live. That is based on everything I have come to understand through the Word and my experiences in life. However, the kind of fear that I'm talking about with these folks that I grew up around, uh, grew up with them teaching me, their kind of fear is different. Their kind of fear is, in my opinion, it's a sort of primal fear. The primal fear of dying only to realize you did not make the cut one way or another, somehow or another, you did not make the cut, and you are resigned to an eternity of burning, horrific, flaming torture. That kind of potential and possibility is enough to make nearly anyone, even strong people, be quite afraid to ask these questions. Now, I've come a long way in just a few years in understanding, long enough to where I can tell you that I don't see any clear teaching of some kind of an eternity of torturous torturous, horrific punishment for a lifetime of sins. Now, you ask the, the popular evangelicals, Protestants, Catholics of today, and keep in mind that even Jews and, unless I'm way off on this, Muslims, or at least some, believe in some form of duality, of heavenly bliss 
and hellish torment. But none of it is biblical. However, if you grow up being taught that, and they really do ingrain that in you, it's enough to keep most people from wanting to question these things. I mean, come on, let's be honest. Most of you listening to me, just like me, either up until this very point in time, or up to a point in time, admit it, you were a devout, loving, wonderful believer in Jesus Christ because you wanted that fire insurance. It doesn't seem to me like that is ever the appropriate reason to ever want to love and get to know this God and his son. Because if you don't, and you don't put your faith in him to cleanse you of your sins, and I'm not being cheeky when I say that in that way, but the idea is that if you don't do it, the effect is that forever horrific burning torture. How many people who today and historically, as long as this doctrine has been taught popularly, have had a deep abiding faith based on their love of the person of this living God we're talking about and his son, his Redeemer. How many people are basing that on a foundation of them loving this God? How many of them are basing that deep abiding faith on they don't want to burn in hell forever. Had I met my wife and had it been put to me that the I had two choices here concerning this woman and there was no other woman available that was it that was who that was it. That was my choice, okay? And, you know, uh, the choice was you can love her for her, for who she is, for everything you can get to know and understand about her. You'll understand those things that move you in a loving way. Uh, you will understand those things that scare you sometimes. You will know her by her tenderness. You will know her by her anger and wrath. But you will know her, and in knowing her, you will come to love her. So that's one choice. The other choice is you can give your love to her or you can be tortured for the rest of your life. Now, which one of those options do you think most people would say sounds the most appealing, or which one of those options would most people consider as free will love? Giving someone your love or giving them the attention and energy that it takes to get to know them, like it takes 
attention and energy and time to get to know the living God. So which one is love? To understand the living God as a very real, particular personality who is good, who is loving, who is just, who does punish, who does show mercy, who is personal, or is love giving enough attention and doing enough deeds, good deeds, at your church building, towards the poor, towards your family, so that you're not tortured forever. Which one of those things is true love? Because I read the words of this God, my God, and his Redeemer. And I love. I don't get to know this living God because of that primal fear of eternal torture in fire. And that difference, that distinction, is paramount in having any kind of relationship with him because the people that perceive him on the second hand, that part where it's him or forever torture, they're never going to get to know him. Ever. They're never going to try and weigh the intricacies and the oddities of his word. They're either going to utterly reject him as a, a sadist, or the time they put in, they're not going to have any kind of heart and mind to it. So it's just pretty much useless. And because I don't love him and want to know everything I can about him, uh, based on a primal fear of eternal torment, I'm comfortable with doing the things that I'm doing. Like the New Testament quotes in the Old Testament context, because like with many other things that could at first seem one way, that may not per se be the answer. But Again, you know what, this is a lot like the Jewish question, is it not? How are we going to understand what the answer is? And I, I, I don't love calling it the Jewish question, but that's essentially what it's called. And that question is, the people today who call themselves Jews, who are they? What is their ancestry. What does this mean in the scheme of the peoples of the world? Who is at the top? Why are these things happening? Is it them and what percentage? You see, there are people who have a lot of influence on social media, grassroots type people. They don't want to touch that. And they're not doing anyone a service by not touching that. Because how are you going to understand these things if it's not brought up into the light? All you're going to have is some kind of an angry mob situation. When somebody who is very charismatic can come along and point out all of the perceived evils of these people called Jews... And we di again, we don't know the ancestry of all of them, how it has come down to us, who all of them are who or not. We don't know what percentage of them may be Judahites, Benjamites, Levites, to coin the English names. 
and what percentage of them could be Canites, Kenites, Kenni, Omlaki, Amalekites, um, Ashkenaz, okay, Sephardim. These are peoples that are not Israelites in the Bible. But do you understand that you can't prove their ascendancy one way or another? Especially if no one's willing to bring it out into the light and examine it. That is not productive. And that is the same reason why these issues should be brought out into the light for examination. And you know, I do not fear criticism or correction of any of my opinions because after all, all my opinions are just that. If I can show you anything factual, if I can show you New Testament verses that when you put them in an Old, te Old Testament context, they do not seem to match contextually, that is something that you should pay attention to. If my interpretation of the one to the other is incorrect, then you should correct me. But bringing this stuff out into the light can do nothing but help. Help the cause of truth. Because everything true does not fear scrutiny. There was one thing that I was going to bring up concerning types of disconnects, New and Old Testament. And remember, a lot of this could be a language issue and let's just say a possibility of an amount of time between the original autographs or source language and the time in which another language, which let's say certain texts were not written in, were copied, who they were copied by, what preconceived notions they had, and so thus what kind of wording they chose to use. We can see that very clearly in just the King James translation. If we get to know the Greek and so-called Hebrew, the Masoretic Hebrew, enough to see the departure of the King James translators from even the, the from even that terminology, as much as I don't agree with uh, Masoretic Hebrew, and in as much as I affirm that classical Greek in itself is still not entirely known, we can see a marked divergence from even those texts to what they gave to the world in English. So it's not that big a stretch to think that this could be some sort of issue that involves men putting a lot of this into Greek from its source language texts and in so doing changing terminology quite a lot to either suit their own personal beliefs or let's just say the zeitgeist. There are a lot of answers for these questions. There's not only just one and we need to find out what are the answers. So let's shine some more light on things. Now in the last one I went through those passages between Diablos and Yusho. I'm not a hundred percent who this Diablos character is and I'll tell you why. I explained in the last one that Shaitan does not even show up until Numbers 22. And if you were to add up and consider all of the occurrences of Shaitan and in what sort of literature you're finding it in, <clears throat> in the various books of the Old Testament where you see Shaitan, I would argue that just the term adversary is quite fitting. In the Old Testament, when you look at all of these occurrences, I think it would be very hard for anyone to argue whether the adversary is a singular individual or whether the adversary is different characters at different times. 
It certainly is not cut and dry clear when you examine Shaitan in the Old Testament. I am quite aware that in Revelation, based on our translations, that Diablos or Shaitan are named as that old serpent, the dragon, the old serpent, right? Named Shaitan and Diablos. I am aware of that. Do a search on Shaitan <clears throat> and look at all of the contexts in the Old Testament and consider one thing too concerning Revelation. There is a lot of doctrine going around today, um, common, everyday, accepted doctrine in evangelical Protestant and Catholic circles. And be, I want you to understand that the doctrines between Catholics, Protestant, and Evangelicals are not as different as you might think, nor is the doctrine between those three groups and Judaism as different as you think, nor are many points of doctrine between those four groups and Muslims or Islam as different as you think. So keep in mind... A lot of the doctrines of today that are popular and accepted doctrines are heavily uh, drawn from the book of Revelation, specifically like the eternal torture of, of hell doctrine. It's pulled heavily from Revelation. Revelation, if you believe that the original autograph of Revelation was Greek, one thing that you should get to know about it is that the Greek is considered to be really poor Greek, especially if it was the same John, the Apostle John, who wrote it. It is not the same style of Greek that is used in 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, nor the Gospel of John. And in fact, a lot of uh, expositors really have a problem with the way that the Greek is used in Revelation. Some have said that they think it's a book that was possibly written by a Hebrew speaker who was using Greek in the best way they could to reflect Hebrew ideas. And the person who said that was pretty sure that it was written in Greek. You see, there's this underlying assumption. There is this base theory that these things had to be written in Greek for crying out loud. Uh, now, Revelation, being as far as the language goes and what scholars have to say about it, um, boy, it is not a book that you want to go to for first hard concrete source doctrinal material. So, I am aware of that quote. The serpent, that old dragon called Diablos and Shaitan. I am. However, I would like you to examine the, uh, the occurrences of Shaitan in the Old Testament and Diablos and what occurrences there are of Satan as a transliteration in the New Testament and start thinking about what the context is or what the mindset is towards this idea in both the Old Testament and New Testament. And the reason I say that is, of course, besides the book of Eub or Job, we don't see this Shatan so much as a character in the Old Testament. There is also a vision of Zechariah where he sees the priest at the time whose name was also Yusho. And this vision is uh, Yusho before the throne of Yahweh. And it said that standing at his right hand was Shatan to accuse him. And he had on filthy garments, and they were removed from him, and he was given clean garments. Uh, of course, it also there are quotes saying that Shatan can no longer stand before the throne to accuse the brethren. But I just would encourage people to think about this idea of Shatan. I really would. 
And, uh, you know, I don't agree with a lot of things that they say, and some of the things they say I think are, are very perceptive, is if you listen to some uh, material by a sect called the Christadelphians, they make a very, very strong argument concerning what Shatan is. I don't agree with the color that their argument takes, but please, please, I'm encouraging you, try to look at Try to look at many different sides, okay? Please understand that our doctrine, as it's been handed down to us as of this day, is so extraordinarily not only Catholic, but Judeo-Catholic. It's not even funny, okay? Consider that. And, and try to take a fresh look at these things. And think about these things for yourself. Don't even consider, you know... Uh, my opinion, you know, think think about these things for yourself. Because if you if you if you exercise that self thinking, and for those of you who believe, if you mingle that with prayer, it's going to get you somewhere. So that's one thing that I noticed is the big difference between from Old Testament to New Testament Shatan as not a a solid concrete defined individual character but in the New Testament far more especially early in Matthew in the wilderness and the temptation same thing with hell you don't and I, I don't want anybody to, to throw Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28 at me. Not one expositor has ever been able to prove that those two passages are about an individual named Satan. Not one, not ever. Those two passages are the mother of assumptions. So, also, this idea of the forever burning torment in hell, when even um, you shows talking about the Gya Hinnom. And uh, you should do a study on Gya Hinnom and what that is, where that is. And don't just take the traditions said about it for granted because they aren't defined in the New Testament. Nobody tells you in the New Testament that this is um, uh, Jerusalem's local garbage burning pit. Okay? You're not told that. So, do some looking. Do some looking. Because that is mostly what he quotes that is turned into hell. And hell is what's turned into the idea of eternal, eternal flaming torment. Gea Hinnom. Look into it. I, I promise you, you will, you will not be sorry you did. Very interesting. Because I want everybody, everybody listening to me, whether you have no faith at all, whether you think the Bible is not accurate, it's not true. I want you, when you put in any kind of time into reading the Bible, I want you to understand that the living God that you are encountering there is not a sadistic beast. He is a person, a personality, yes. And you'll find out what that, what that is if you choose to put the time into finding out. You can't just eisegete a few passages and build a case um, that matches your misconception of who this God is. That's just not going to work. I don't care... I don't care what it does for me or, or all the things you could tell me that are terrible about him. It doesn't do anything for you. What does it do for you to not know, to be ignorant of these matters? Does it do you any good? So, to start in, again, those few quotes from The Temptation in the Wilderness, I think those three... You don't necessarily have to argue over context. I did bring up the one quote from Diablos, 
saying that that passage, which is said to be from Psalm 90 or 91, depending on if you're in Breton or KJV, he said was written about you, and we read it, and I would have, look, I would have thought that there would have been something that would tell us who the author of that psalm, which it looks to be David, was speaking to, correct? Am I not correct? All right. So what we do is we pick up at this spot here. It's, it's Matthew 4, 15 and 16. I'll go to the KJV and I'll go to Matthew 4. Now, it says at 412, you love these big headings. They give you, they give you a really good idea of what you're about to read. You see, they already lock your mind into what you're about to experience. Don't pay attention to those. If you have those in your Bible, <clears throat> try to ignore them. Try to ignore all of them. Everything that isn't text in your Bible, try to ignore. If you need to use that as quick reference, I understand, because I do the same thing. If I need to figure out, I can't remember, let's say, uh, which chapter was that that uh, Leah had named her children in, in Genesis, then I can look in the Q Bible that I use right here. Um, right here. It says right at the top. It'll give you those, um, you know, here's basically what happened in this chapter. And I love how they even say it in King James English. Like, verse 26, come forteth the people. Can't beat that. Anyways, I'm going to get to the uh, appropriate chapter in there just to, to get myself ahead because I was I, I get in the middle of doing the studies that I have to do every day, which are a bit different than what we're doing here. And, um, you know, by the time I, I get to you, my computer is, is full of all kinds of uh, different information. So in Matthew 4.12, it says, Now when Yusho had heard that John, which if it's John, J-O-H-N, it'd be Yohanan, like Johan with another N, Johanan, was cast into prison, he departed into the Galil. Look up the Galil. There's multiple um, entries in Strong's. Galil, and even the, the double L in it with the G, um, indicates especially in context that we're talking about a we're talking about a defined sort of area a galil can be a predefined region and subject of someone's dialogue just keep that in mind okay he departed into a galil that's why a lot of jewish new testaments or even the Jewish Old Testaments will call it the Galilee. Same thing with a eh, Lebanon, or they'll call it the Lebanon, because again, it was a, a type of region. Laban, Lebanon, the UN uh, being uh, a descriptive, okay? Laban being the accepted word for white. Uh, and what does that mean exactly? I haven't made up my mind yet. Is it a mountainous area where the mountains are all snow-capped? I haven't made up my mind yet. I don't know, but I'm trying to uh, give you as much information as I've gathered to help you in any way. Okay, so he departed into, when he found out that Yohanan was cast into prison, he departed into the Galil. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast in the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali. It's on the sea coast. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Esaias the prophet, saying, The land of 
Zebulon and the land of Naphtalim by the way of the sea beyond Jordan. Galilee of the Gentiles. The people which sat in darkness saw a great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death light is sprung up. From that time Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So anyways, we're directed to Isaiah 9, 1 and 2 for the quote that we just saw in Matthew. said, because he left Nazareth and he came and dwelt at Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast in the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali. Okay. We can TSK four thirteen and make sure we're not missing anything. Okay. In Luke four, thirty and thirty one, he was passing through the midst of them, he went his way, I remember that, and came down to Capernaum, a city in Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath days. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which had been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained unto this day. How about that? <clears throat> when they came to Capernaum, ah, I didn't mean to do that. Darn it. Sorry. Go back to that. I accidentally clicked on it. Me and my itchy trigger finger. So John 4.46 says, So Jesus came unto Cana of Galilee, where he made water and wine. Right. Certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. All right. So there's a certain amount of agreement here that where he was starting was in this place called Capernaum, right? And, um, and John says Cana, right? And the others call it Galilee. All right. They do actually have a reference to Joshua in the lot of Zebulun. Interesting. I read that too, because this, this has a lot to do with where we're at. In Joshua 19, 10 through 16, in King James, I'm guessing, style English, the third lot came up for the children of Zebulun, according to their families, and the border of their inheritance was unto Sarid. By the way, these are KJV translations of these words, and I'm just reading the translations of these words, not as these words would have originally been pronounced, as per my theories concerning Obery. And their border went up towards the sea, and Morala, and reached to Dabasheth, and reached to the river, that is before Jochnium, and turned from Sarid eastward towards the sun rising unto the border of Chisloth Tabor, and then goes out to Deborath and goes up to Japhia, up to Japhia, and from thence passeth on along on the east to Gita. Hefer and Ita Kazin and goes out to Riman Methor to Nia. It would be easier to read these things if they just would have stuck with the original spelling. Anyways, and the border compasseth on the north side to Hanathon, and the outgoings thereof are in the valley of Jiphthahel. Jiphthahel? and Kata and Nahalal, and Shimron, and Idala and Bethlehem. Twelve cities and their villages. This is the inheritance of the children of Zebulun, according to their families, these cities with their villages. 
They don't give us Naphtali. I promise you. Oh, yes, they do. Sorry, right below. Now the sixth lot came to the children of Naphtali, even for the children of Naphtali, according to their families. And their coast was from Heleph, <coughs> from Alan, to Zananim, to Adami, Nekib, Jabneel, unto Lakum, and the outgoings thereof were at Jordan. Now, don't try to remember all of these, because... I can promise you one thing. If you keep track of this stuff in Joshua, you start from <laughs> you start from Exodus, keep track in Exodus, not so much in Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, and then you keep good track of Joshua and you keep good track of Judges, you are going to see that the amount of the sheer amount of cities that they took over that were already there, not to mention all that was built and produced from the time of the kings onward, well, from the time of Joshua and the judges onward, they did build after they took these places over. The sheer amount of them are massive. They're massive. Anyone in their right mind would have to think how this many cities could be fit into this place called Palestine. Especially understanding the especially understanding the landscape to the south, south of Jerusalem. Not nice. So I'll continue. Then the coast turns westward to Asnoth Tabor and goes out from thence to Hukok and reached, uh, reacheth to Zebulun on the south side and reacheth to Asher on the west side and to Judah upon Jordan toward the sun rising. That's interesting, isn't it? To put that together. Now, and the fenced cities are Zidim, Zer, and Hamath, Raqqa, and Kunrath. Kunrath. That's the same name that you're going to find when you look in the Old Testament. And you see this Yum Kunrath. A canoer is a musical instrument first mentioned in the genealogy of Cain, Keen, Q Y N, Keen, called Cain, one of his descendants, Jubal. The translations say that he was the master of all those who handle the harp and organ. And the instrument that is used for harp is this um, canoer. So, K-N-U-R. I might have mentioned this before, but I can't say it enough times because we're talking about a completely different language. Not only that, but we're talking about a language which I believe um, I'm having to actually code crack because I cannot learn it properly if I go through the channels of learning all of the ridiculous, I'm sorry, ridiculous, ins and outs of Masoretic and their Nikud <laughs> and their lexicons um, because I would emerge from that more confused than I am now. But I'm going to say this. When, when roots are combined in various ways, like say canoer, okay, canoer is uh, K-N-U-R, and, and that is what's translated as harp. Is it a harp? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know that it's a harp. Could be a stringed instrument. Based on the uh, the look of the characters that are in it. <clears throat> Maybe. Maybe. So, if you were to pluralize this, you could very easily, and I'm saying this because this is what I observe, I'm not saying this because I have a mastery of the original and unknown forgotten language. This is what I observe. You can drop the U between the N and the R. I call it an U because it's usually called a Vav or Wa, but it makes the U sound. And Vav and Wa are misleading because they're naming these something that I don't believe them to be. So you drop the U between the N and the R, and then 
what would typically happen is if you wanted to give it the feminine plural, you would add then an u and a th, so-called tav. Quite often, I have seen this in the feminine plural without the u. I'm not giving you concretes here. I'm giving you my observations, okay? So, I can't tell you absolutely that that th called tav, just a th at the end, basically looks like a mark on, uh, on the diagonal, like x marks the spot, pretty much. It's got a longer leg on one side than the other, though. Okay, so it could sort of look like a cross at a diagonal. But if you have the K, N, R, Th, Kunruth, it could mean whatever that musical instrument is in a feminine plural. That is the fenced city that was just named, and that is also what you'll find constantly in this Yam Kunruth. And it goes down, it says, and Adama Rama Hazor, Kedesh Edrai, and Hazor, Iron, Migdalel, Horam, Benath, and Beth Shemesh, 19 cities with their villages. So those are cities that I would think fortified with their hamlets around them for the people who are growing crops and grazing livestock. <laughs> When we see that fenced city, like we did in verse 35, I think what we're looking at there are fully fortified war cities. If you think about it, I'm not saying this is how it has to be, but quite possibly. There were, at the time of Genesis 15, 19 through 21, far more than 10 different kinds of people living in the land. Genesis 15, 19 through 21 only names the Kinim, those are the descendants of Kin, called Cain, the Kinazim, which cannot be related to Kinaz as we understand the grandson of Oshu or Esau, because he wouldn't be born for many years. So we have the Kinazim, we have the Kadmonim, we have the Hathim, we have the Perazim, the Rapaim, the Amarim, the Kenonim, the Gargshim, and the Yebusim. And that's not everybody that was living there. And these people probably would cluster based on their tribe, because people are tribal. And of course, they would need a fortified area that would be like a castle. And around this area would be a hamlet or hamlets. And we know that this was during an age of walled cities. Now, in the hamlets, the people would do their agrarian business. Or they would have their base for their agrarian business, you see. And when there was a threat from the outside, all of these people and the valuables, everything they could possibly bring with them, would hole up inside the city itself because it would be walled. What I would assume is that when we see the fenced cities, different word, and there are fewer of those than these normal cities with their surrounding towns or hamlets, these cities would be more like central armory type cities. If other cities were to fall, people could head to these and these would be far larger. That's my assumption as for right now. So anyways, verse 39, this is the inheritance of the tribe of the children of Naphtali, according to their families, the cities, and their villages. Pay attention that not only was Conrath within the bounds of what they were given, but this Adma and Rama and Hazor. 
If you do searches on Adama, this Rama, it's called an Hazur, you're going to find some interesting things about where the Bible says those things are basically located. And you can double check and read concerning that border of Naphtali. That's really important. So, with that in mind, we'll go back and we'll hit this Isaiah 9, 1, and 2. And lucky for us, it's Isaiah 9, 1, and 2 in both KJV and Septuagint. Because that can get a little bit confusing for me. I don't know about you, but yeah when it's 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 Isaiah 40 in uh, the KJV based on the Masoretic and it's Isaiah 50 based on the Septuagint and the Brentons it's just a little bit confusing all right so I'm at the KJV Isaiah 9 1 I'm gonna have to do two things before I even read that Isaiah 9 1 and 2 it's two things these are super important folks they really are because we want to know the truth the whole truth nothing but the truth I have on my screen what is an accepted map of the way that Palestine looked in the days of the uh, allotments around Joshua okay Joshua judges <coughs> we've got Zebulun in the, on this one, we've got Zebulun landlocked, which cannot possibly be the case. And I can show you this sometime in later videos when I actually have time to finish my paper on tribal allotments, which I started some time ago. I'm in the middle of so many things, honestly. And um, so we've <laughs> got it landlocked here. And then they've got uh, Naphtali going from the bottom of the Sea of Galilee. That is so unfair to call that a sea. It is very small, not deep. I don't know how you're going to get the kind of storms that are described in the New Testament on it. Anyways, nor the size of boats that you would need. So, Naphtali is said to stretch way up north. Now you see, they say that the Jordan River starts much north of the Sea of Galilee, empties out into the Sea of Galilee, and then, kind of like a city street, it continues south of the Sea of Galilee as the same river. Interesting. I guess they just decided that it would be the same river that proceeds from this Sea of Galilee as the one that goes into it. <laughs> but never mind that. I don't see that that often. Not with uh, other lakes where a river enters into it in one side and then there's a river that goes out of it. Oftentimes they're different names because how... How is it they can, how do they decide that? That that's the same river? Is it, is there a, and I'm being serious, I'm not being cheeky, okay? Is there a measurable current, like a highway, that goes straight through the middle of that lake and continues? I mean, there's water movement, right? Doesn't matter. What you got to pay attention to is where they're saying Zebulun and Naphtali are. And again, I'm using their uh, their English translated names. Uh, however, in um, in you show the book, so called Joshua, 1934. I'm just going to go over this one more time, okay? And them the coast turn when they say coast, it's Gabul, it's border, coast, it's a border. The border. It says it turns west. It's Yama. Um, Yama with the E, more like the Gabul, the border westward. Westish. 
um, to Asnuth Thabur, and it goes out from there to Hukuk, and reaches to Zebulun, or Zebulun. And it says that it reaches, and it says, in Zebulun, and this is from Negev. So, they say on the south side, from Negev. It reaches to Asher, another tribe, reaches to Asher. And they say, from the west, on the west side, and then to Yehuda, upon Yarden, and this is an interesting one, Mizra Eshemash, which they use Mizra as the rising. And here it's paired with Sun Shemash, rising the Shemash. So if we say that that is eastward, um, there's not a map that exists that can make that happen. If you sat down with these simple descriptions of where the tribal allotments are supposed to be, there is not a map that exists of Palestine, no matter how much playing they do with tribal allotments in Palestine. They can't make it happen, and they can't make this description I'm reading right here happen. But if they played around with the words enough, to where they can make it happen. You have to admit something, no matter if you can play with the words or not. And what you have to admit is that, um, who am I looking at? <laughs> Naphtali, not Zebulun. You'd have to admit that Naphtali bordered Judah or Judah. Right, take us back to the map. It's agreed on by everyone that Judah has to be down here. The reason they have to agree on that is because of the descriptions of the borders of Judah. Because at a certain point, the border hits a place. And there is a Nahal which I believe is most likely the um, Shihur, that will divide Iyuda from Mitzrim. Now keep in mind, even on their maps, where they have to try to fit this into Palestine, even on their maps, they have Shimun or Simeon in the middle of Iyuda, which is accurate by descriptions in the Bible. <laughs> so, how Simeon was part of the Northern Kingdom when they split is a odd one to me. Because hasn't everybody always heard that the kingdom was split, right? Between ten in the north and three in the south. Well, the kingdom of Yisrael, or the house of Israel, is never described as northern, Tzipun, nor is the kingdom of Yehuda or Judah described as southern. Keep that in mind. Either way, you have to have Naphtali touching Judah. You have to. So, we'll go back to Isaiah 9, and that was necessary. Oh, the second thing I have to do. So, remember, the other day, when we were going over the, Behold, a, well, from the New Testament, a virgin shall conceive and, and give birth, and, and his name will be Emmanuel, and we found out it's Omnu Al, and we discussed the possibilities there of Omnu Al, well, right after that passage, we're led into Yeshua 8, and he had recorded 
uh, in a large scroll with witnesses. This is so fascinating. It just has to be broken down and understood, really. Um, and, and, and so he wrote this name in this, uh, in this great role with, with witnesses. And then it says that he went into the prophetess, and she conceived, and he named the, the child that. However, multiple times in the rest of this uh, chapter, not only are the people spoken of so much, but we see that Omnu Al a couple of different times, at least one time that Strong's will not record for us. Why? Now remember, before that child would be on to solid food and know to reject evil and embrace good, that those two kings, the king of Yisrael and the king of Damshak or Aram, would be overthrown by Yahweh. Now he goes on after this, and, and I'm going to, I'm sorry, but I, I am going to sort of sum it up to make out that Yehuda is not all that great either, because they're not. But starting in Isaiah 8.11, we could say, For Yahweh spake thus to me with a strong hand and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, Say ye not a confederacy to all them who this people shall say a confederacy, neither fear ye their fear, nor be afraid. Sanctify Yahweh Sabaoth of, or of hosts or hordes. Sanctify Yahweh Sabaoth himself, and let them be your fear, and let him be your dread. Let him be your fear, and he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone. But for a stone of stumbling. And for a rock of offense, to both the houses of Yisrael for a jinn and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples, and I will wait upon Yahweh that hideth his face from the house of Eokab, Jacob, and I will look for him. Behold, I and the children whom Yahweh has given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from Yahweh Tzebeoth, which dwelleth in Er Tzion, or Mount Zion. And then interesting, Isaiah says, Behold, I and the children whom Yahweh hath given me are for signs and wonders. And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God, for the living and the dead? To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. And they shall pass through it, hardly bestead and hungry, and it shall come to pass that when they shall be hungry, they shall fret themselves and curse their king and their God, and look upward, and they shall look unto the earth, and behold trouble and darkness, dimness of anguish, and they shall be driven to darkness. That's the way 8 ends. Now, 9, 1. Remember, there weren't chapters and verse separations when he's writing this. Now, Isaiah 9, 1. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali and afterward did more grievously afflict her by way of the sea, beyond Jordan, in Galilee of the nations. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. You have multiplied the nation, and not increased her joy. 
they joy before thee according to the joy in harvest, and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you have broken the yoke of his burden, and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise, and garments rolled in blood, but this shall be with burning and fuel of fire, for unto us a child is born. You, does this sound familiar? And unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and the name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David, and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even for ever. The zeal of Yahweh Tzebaoth will perform this. And now uh, it changes tone in Isaiah 9, 8 when Yahweh sent a word to Yochab and it hath lighted upon Yisrael. So there's, there's actually quite a lot more that still means a lot to the context of Isaiah 9. what's kind of interesting so we were in KJV and I can switch over to Brenton's <clears throat> and and Brenton says so this is based on Septuagint drink this first act quickly O land of Zabulon land of Naphtalim and the rest inhabiting the sea coast and the and the land beyond Jordan Galilee of the Gentiles. O people walking in darkness, behold a great light, ye that dwell in the region and shadow of death, a light shall shine upon you. Well, according to the maps they're giving us, that doesn't work. It doesn't make any sense even. But I want to look at Isaiah 9 according to the source language. Okay, so the thing is, uh, in the source language, Isaiah 9 2, we're basically seeing what we see written in uh, the English translations that I've just read from. What is interesting is when we look at the beginning of the prophecy in Isaiah 9 1, we get here where, you know, we've got U Eretze, so the land, eh, and then the eh at the end is sort of like uh, the land-ish, all right? So it's basically uh, a less defined area. So the, it would be like a town, and if you were basically saying the area of the town, so I'm sorry to go that far into it, but everything is important. Naphtali, um, oh, and Zebulun was named before that because it was Aratze Zebulun U Aratze Naphtali. So, and the area of Naphtali. And, uh, now this is one thing, Ahrun, so, and the, you could say ladder and, um, it's also used in context of former and latter, like contexts where uh, <laughs> the Bible talks about the former sea and the latter sea. Interesting, right? And the Arun, the, like it says as I float over it, say hinder or last part, <clears throat> it could mean westward if last uh, is meant to mean westward, like if... Uh, Kadem is meant to mean uh, uh, front, forward, or ancient, and east all at once. Now, this Echabid, Darak, E Yam, Ober, E Yardan, Galil, E Guyim. So, this heaviness in the way of the sea. Over the Yardan, Galil, Eguim. 
Galil. Absolutely not has to be Galilee. Now, it's funny, when I float over, it says like a circle or circuit. It's a region. It's an area. It's a defined area by the speaker, usually. So, the region, the Gleim. So, what I find really interesting about all of this is the use of Ober E Yerdan. <clears throat> First thing is, um, most people that are mapping uh, where they say that the tribal inheritances were in Palestine. I can go back to the map here real quick. Some uh, want to say that uh, Naphtali would be way up here past this lake of Galilee. And then, of course, they've got Zebulun landlocked. And not everybody agrees on that. Uh, many agree with uh, biblical descriptions where they see Zebulun needing to be on a sea. So some of them will stick Zebulun here against uh, Lake Galilee. Some will stick Neb uh, Zebulun on the uh, coast of the Mediterranean. Okay. Galilee, right? Galil of the Gentiles. Why do they call it Galilee in the New Testament? If it's Galil, it's definitely, it's hard. Concrete definition is a predetermined region. And it is said this way. So they are, are they're including, uh, the, uh, not they, the Bible, is including um, Zebulun, Naphtali, and the uh, Rune, so ladder or westward. And it is being described as this, this heavy way as interesting enough as that is to look at that, the heavy way, the Yam, Ober, E, Yardan, Galil, E, Guim. Why over Yardan? If you're not catching what I'm trying to say here, <clears throat> this is... This is the modern Jordan River, runs north to south from Lake Galilee to the Dead Sea. They say that a portion of the Jordan is also up here above Lake Galilee. Now, every time that you'll see Reuben, Gad, and half of Minshe talked about, they're talked about Ober Yardan. Whenever you see people traveling from one side to the other, it's Ober Yardan. When they speak of when they were outside of the land to when they came into the land, it's Ober Yardan. You will not see the texts being described Ober Yardan as in far north, but they will tell you that's what it means, even though Ober always means to cross, and you'll see that whenever there is a supposed river or anything that would need crossing, it's Ober. But somehow, Yeshua the prophet is around the area of Jerusalem, and we're told it's over here, due west of the northern tip of the Dead Sea, and that he's speaking of a place directly north of him, as in Ober e Yardan, over the Jordan. And they will tell us, oh, that just means so far north that there's no more Jordan. Well, the Jordan's watershed is still up here. If that truly is the Jordan on the north, as they have uh, just designated it to be. This same thing happens. In Deuteronomy, I'll show you real quick. Here in Deuteronomy 1.1, 1, 1, it says, These are all the words in which Moshe spoke to all Israel. And then the wording is, Be, Ober, E, Yerdan. So if you want to translate it mechanically, you could say, In, Over, 
the Yardan. However, they hadn't come into the land at this time, so they're talking about on the other side of Yardan. If Yardan is essentially a demarcation point, which it does seem to be. Why would that be said if you understand where they are and that everybody tells you, I don't have a big enough map? I don't have a big enough map. Let me see if I can find a big map that extends, uh, that extends southward so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. I don't want it here. I don't want to lose it. So there's a much bigger map. That is what I'm talking about. And it says that they are in Kadesh at this time. This is hard to see, I know, because this map is very small. But if you could imagine where the modern city of um, Tel Aviv is, and you would draw a line directly south the way that maps normally sit in orientation, you would get to the area where they say Kadesh was supposed to have been. Yet they are going to describe this area where they were at as in Ober at Yardin. That has nothing to do with time before they went into the land. But that Yardan is absolutely always used as this demarcation. Yet this area of Zebulun, Naphtali, and I think you should do a word study if you have the time. On 0314, I have in the past, Ahrun, ladder. You have the former and you have the latter. You'd be surprised when you see those quotes about the former sea and the latter sea, like the river that's going to flow out of Jerusalem <clears throat> to the former sea, to the latter sea, chasing uh, the enemies to the former sea, to the latter sea, or their front to the former sea, their back to the latter sea. Now, how all of that can be described by Yeshua the prophet, who is essentially around Jerusalem, as far as we know, all the time. We would not think for any reason he would have any reason to be in Reuben at this time, or in Gad or Minshe. And in general, the way that they speak in the Bible geographically, It would be hard to imagine why he would refer to them as being over the Yardan, and that area as over the Yardan. Unless, possibly, the place that we're talking about, which would help us to understand how it was that Naphtali was touching Judah at some point. Remember, they're touching a few different people, Zebulun, Asher, Judah, right? Unless perhaps that the Yardan, the actual river Yardan, has some kind of a hard bend to it? It's a possibility. There are a few possibilities. And I don't know yet what all of them are. I just keep coming back to this problem that I have with Palestine matching the text. Always. Now that was a bit of a rabbit trail, sort of. But it does have to do with us reading New Testament quotes in Old Testament context. I did think that it was uh, very interesting that um, not long after this, we get into Isaiah 9 6, and we're going to see that again, by the way. For to us a child is born. I'm in Brenton's. A son is given to us whose government is upon his shoulder, and his name is called the messenger of great counsel, for I will bring peace upon the princes and health to him. That's interesting that in Brenton's 9.6, we don't have what we have in KJV 9.6, which is based on the Masoretic, which of course most people understand that most people say that the Masoretic was tweaked and perverted to be less and less and less and less messianic concerning you show as Messiah. But in Isaiah 9, 6, we get all of these terms that all the evangelicals really love, which is the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. And here in Brenton's 9, 6, 
We've got, uh, his name is called the Messenger of Great Counsel. Colon. For I will bring peace upon the princes and health to him. <sighs> what more can I say? I, I feel so inadequate here. I really do. I feel so inadequate. Because every time I have to go and look at the text with my limited understanding of what the source text is. Because there's a huge difference between that and what they say that it is as according to the rules and dictations of the Masoretes. You have to understand I feel so inadequate when I go and look at it. And I realize that so much of these prophecies are probably not very well understood. And so that can have so much to do with, including the things that I talked about earlier with the Greek and the assumptions of the New Testament and the texts and all of that. But we do have a disconnect. We have many disconnects. Ask any uh, evangelical, Protestant, Catholic, to show me baptism in the Old Testament. Everything we should see in the New Testament should be a fulfillment of the messianic prophecies of the Old Testament. And if we're looking at these verses in the New Testament and they're not lining up, at least in context with the Old Testament, then there are questions that have to be asked. They ought to be answered. And there's a lot of them. There's far more than I could even begin to, to tackle to, to find the answers to. But it's a lot. It's a lot. And, and just the differences in languages that I've shown you. How at points where they just say they use the term man... And then we get this idea that man is everyone with two legs that speaks a similar language as us, and yada, 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 yada. Is that what we're to understand? You know, Yusho referred to himself so often as son of man. But when we go back to the Old Testament, we can see, like, for instance, with the prophet Ezekiel, he is called Bani Adam. He's son of Adam. Should Adam and man be regarded as equivalents? I know some of these are questions that some people don't like. Um, they're definitely questions that would make somebody who I think is very much dyed in the wool, a uh, longtime student of the scriptures as we currently have them in their current manifestation. This would upset them. But we need answers, because if we don't have answers, <laughs> how do you expect to how do you expect to share your faith and anything good about this stuff with somebody else? When you're not at least even willing to look at this stuff and to say, yes, I see that it's there, it does seem problematic, and I'm not sure what the answer is. Because if none of us are willing to do that, I don't think any of us have sufficient answers for anyone. And you know, most of the people that we're going to be speaking to are the fire insurance crowd either the ones who've bought up a lot of fire insurance because of that primal fear I was talking about, or those who absolutely reject this God and his Messiah because of the fire insurance principle. So I've ran very late, my son's up, and I have to go for the day. So I hope all of you are really greatly blessed by, by this, and uh, I hope that you'll take care of one another and yourselves, and I'll see you soon, I hope.